This is a question for both of you. What are the techniques you or Mauricio would use for a buyer or seller who wants to do a deal but is resisting? Do you use mirroring, accusation audit, labeling, voodoo language? I, 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 I want to hear the voodoo language that Mauricio uses. Well, I, I, I'm not sure I understand the voodoo language, um, Chris. So why don't you tell me about this voodoo language stuff? Yeah, well, Raymond, where, um, Mauricio's got a very definite take. I mean, it sounds like you're dealing with reluctance. And my guess is it's a, it's a you know, I've got certain granular, very specifics. And Mauricio's a great practitioner, a great gut instinct guy with a really long track record and understanding of his environment. So, Marisha, we got a we got let's we got a seller who's reluctant to do the deal. What, what what's the empathy approach, confidence, solution oriented uh, that you bring to the table? Well, I, I, you know, again, we have to understand why the seller is reluctant to do the deal, right? What, what what is it that is the reluctancy? Is it a price? Is it a fear that they're not going to find another house? Um, is it, you know, uh, wh why are they reluctant? Is the seller going through a divorce, right? And, uh, and maybe, you know, working out their differences. I have no idea, right? So I think we really just have to understand, um, you know, what, the, what, what those reasons are, and then you need to be able to react. And, and that's, that goes back to what I always say about reading the room, right? And so there's not one, you've said it a couple of times even today, and you say it all the time, Chris, there's not one solution for anything, for everything. You can't just say, well, what do you do? Do you mirror? Do you voodoo? Do you do this? You got to read the room. You got to understand who that client is. And then you got to figure out, you know, what, what that, you know, looks like. Yeah, you, you're hitting on a theme that actually I've been talking about with a bunch of clients today. I mean, the read is first. And then you begin to respond to the read. You don't, uh, and and you calibrate what your approach based on what you're seeing in front of you and the awareness you're demonstrating of your client. You know, Raymond, how do you I like, like that? that? Sometimes I like to throw out some crazy question or some crazy comment in the middle of a conversation that just makes no sense um, or really out of left field. If I can't read the room, just to see how my the client, you know, on the other side is going to react. Um, and that maybe sometimes creates an emotion on the other side where it actually allows me to start understanding what type of client or what type of person I'm dealing with on the other side. And then I can start tailoring. Like sometimes if I just feel like I'm just hitting dead ends and I'm not finding anywhere and I'm not like getting or, or anywhere, I literally just throw out something out of left field. Right. Um, and, and I'm trying to think of an example, but like, you know, I might just swear like out of nowhere, or I might just, uh, you know, ask like a, a really like, dumb stupid question to sound really dumb or or, or something like that that's just so different that that gives you know that, that creates an emotion um that allows me to start reading this person's personality because sometimes you just feel like you're getting to a dead end and like chris said at the end of the day you, you know if you win 93 percent, you know that's not a terrible win uh percentage you can get into the hall of fame with that that that, that you can yeah Pat, pattern interrupt i mean Frank Bowles, hostage negotiator, started things with NYPD. One time he had a suicidal guy where he said, you think it's going to rain? And it was a cl clear blue sky. And a guy a guy on a ledge says, what are, you, what, are you, what are you talking about? But that was the pattern, the crazy thing that you're talking about. Yeah. Beautiful. I love it. Raymond, thank you very much. Thanks for being on with us thank, today. Thank you, fellas. All right, Frederick, you're up now. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Chris and Mauricio. Um, first of all, I really enjoy both of your work. Um, I'm in the mortgage industry, which means I live in negative conversations on, yeah, you do. on a regular basis. Um, so, but that's not the content of my question. Uh, about seven years ago, uh, I couldn't sleep at night um, and I went back to school and now I'm an, art, uh, I'm an expert in artificial intelligence and neural networks. I'm actually a professor uh, also. Um, I Where? believe the conversations in real estate are, lacking. So I've started developing my own dashboards and whatnot, really, which goes to the heart of the question I'm going to ask both of you. I believe that a far larger question and problem right now is not necessarily in our uh, lawsuit, but really the expectations and the requirements of the consumer going forward. I think we're going to experience, for me personally, a dramatic shift in the expectations on the people that and the execution of what's being delivered. What is your take? And, uh, I'm listening. Well, 
What, what do you mean by a dramatic shift from your perspective and the buyers, right? Because you're, you're in the mortgage business, right? And so um, yeah, how are you seeing that dramatic shift out of curiosity? I, I generally, you know, I used to buy and sell mortgage-backed securities also. So I'm not your average mortgage guy, right? Um, but I see on on average, the, the average realtor is not providing metrics definition to consumers value and the value added conversations that I think really that the consumers, at least from uh, the target market that I'm experiencing and probably Mauricio, you live in this world, I'm sure, um, where you want to know what your return, your estimated return on investment is. What's the probability of accept a contract? Tell me about uh, the statistics and the probabilities of where the market is shifting and moving. Um, do they have the capacity to be able to answer those in a formative manner? If that makes any sense. Oh, well, I've hit you. I think you've hit the nail on the head on that one. I think that one of the things that's happening um, and one of my frustrations is that it's been way too easy to get a real estate license. Yeah. Um, and so what ends up happening is we've got, you know, whatever, you know, the current number is 1.5 million real estate agents are in the country, you know, plus or minus, you know, whatever that right number is. And a lot of those, they don't have never done a transactions. And a lot of those, you know, got their real estate licenses and, and practices, but they don't really know what they're talking about because it's not much more difficult to get a real estate license than it is to get a, uh, uh, you know, a driver's license. Right. Um, and so from my, my perspective is that there, there does need to be a lot of changes in that world. Um, and um, we do need to improve the level of people that we have out there. And I think there's two things that are going to happen. Um, number one is that, um, the, 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 the agents that stand out that know their value, that can talk about everything that you just talked about, that can understand dashboards, that can understand metrics, that can understand probabilities of success, that can talk about comparables, that can talk about all of those things that know how to negotiate, they will stand out and they will do more business. Okay. Um, the agents that don't know what they're talking about uh, are going to weed out, and they're going to leave and they're going to go to another businesses. So I personally predict that we're going to have less real estate agents in the country delivering better service eventually. I hope that that's the case. I hope that my prediction's right on that. Number two is I think associations, Department of Real Estate needs to make uh, licensing more difficult, okay? Uh, it's too easy. And I actually think that we have a responsibility. Uh, NAR has a responsibility, I think, that the pro, you know to, to lobby um, and to make the, uh, the, the licensing more difficult. The problem is that they have a conflict of interest. And the conflict of interest is that they make money based on how many uh, agents are paying dues, right? Right. And so, make it easier, pay more dues, make you know way better. Uh, but it is a conflict of interest. It's not the way we should be doing it. It's not the way it should be going. And I agree with you 100. percent But I do think that a lot of this, what's happening right now, will help weed out uh, a lot of those bad agents. And by the way, it's been a very difficult market. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but you know, we've had, I think. Two million sales, two million transact, two million homes uh, sold in the last twelve months, which is the lowest it's been in twenty eight years. Right. So also, when you have a bad market, you also weed out a bunch of the people that are not doing business. But do you know that in nineteen seventy six, an average real estate agent did something like um, I don't know, t eight transactions a year or twelve transactions a year. Uh, today, an average real estate agent is doing less than one transaction per year, right, or one point two. We have today, we have efficiencies, we have an internet, we have a cell phone, we have all of these things. In 1976, we did these transactions by writing on carbon paper contracts that we had to like, you know, run around and go and fission. So just think about that. And the reason for that is because it's, it's because we have uh, um, more, it's because we have less real estate agents. I, we had less real estate agents back then to the amount of transactions that were occurring. Right. And right now it's just too many people fighting for, for, for transactions.